What happens when two seasoned business leaders get together? They talk shop, of course. Sit back and listen in as Scott DeLong and Vince Moiso share from their experience around current issues facing executives, entrepreneurs, and their leadership teams. The CEO Podcast starts now. Hey everybody, Vince Moiso here with the CEO Podcast. I'm here as always with my partner in crime, Scott DeLong, and we have a very special guest today. Can we agree not to do crime this year? Like, <laughs> we're gonna kind of try to clean up our act just a little bit, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Do we have to? No. Okay. <laughs> Still our podcast, we can do what we want. <laughs> exactly. Especially since with our one listener who's our guest today. There you go. <laughs> Well, I have a very special guest today uh, with me, and she happens to be my niece, Gina Lind. And uh, she is all the way here from Hana, Maui. Uh, and she's been visiting over over Christmas, uh, spent a little bit of time in Big Bear. Uh, so got to bring the kids to the snow and experience the cold and San Clemente and everything that Dana Point and San Clemente have to have to offer pretty, nice. pre- pretty much. Uh, and, and I'm excited to have her on the podcast, and I'm going to tell you why. You, you, most of you that that listen very regularly know that that one of my very favorite episodes we had a guest Josiah Lilly, uh, his company's Epic Ceramic and Stone, and uh, that was called True Grit, and and it was really around this bootstrap entrepreneur concept. It's just you know those those type of entrepreneurs that just work from ground up, that start from nothing, that create something from nothing, and then ultimately build it into a lifestyle. Uh, that that suits what they want out of out of life, and I share I've shared this in the past, and and I shared obviously on that episode. If you want to check it out, how much I just really admire um, people like that. So so uh, people like Gina, uh, my my brother in law, uh, Josiah Lilly, these people that are just bootstrap man. I you guys are my heroes. I I love stories like that, and I think Gina has a great story to tell about her experience. Um, before we get started, uh, as always, you know, we're, we're uh, pretty focused on Spotify and Apple pa- Podcasts these days, although you can find us across many channels. You can go on YouTube, of course, and you can watch the video. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel and, and follow, follow us there. Uh, and then as always, we want your feedback, right? Really, really important. Uh, you can get a hold of us, uh, Scott and Vince at gmail.com. Uh, check us out at the CEO podcast. And, and feedback net. means all feedback. Critique is fine. Absolutely. Like, tell us where we can improve. Tell us what you want to hear. Tell us where you challenge us, where you disagree with what we have to say. Um, that would be fun. Try that. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Well, and we want topics. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously we've got a great lineup for for season four. And and I mean, I can't even believe that we're in season four. This is right. crazy. But uh, we've got a great lineup and very excited about uh, the guests we have today among future guests and topics that we have outlined. But we want topics from you guys, from our listeners, uh, what's hot and and what what is really top of mind so we can discuss that as well. Exactly. All right. How about we get down let's, to business? Let's get back to Gina then. Yeah. Gina, can you spend just a few minutes? Tell us tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and and really your business with your husband and what you guys what you guys are doing out in Hana so that the listeners can get an idea of what we're talking about here. OK. Um, my name is Gina Lind. I'm um, like my uncle Vinny said, I'm his niece. I'm the oldest niece. He's the youngest child. So we're about five years apart. So we spent a lot of time growing up together. Yeah. Um, I'm born and raised did. on Maui, <laughs> Hawaii, but I came, would come up to Costa Mesa when they were here, or I'd go up to Oregon. So that was really mm-hmm. important part of growing up is, um, seeing other things, getting off the Island. Yeah. And, um, but I've never lived anywhere else really, but Maui. I'm, we're in Hana now. I'm a special education teacher. I have five children with my husband, Greggy. And we have three or four businesses. Um, <laughs> I, I might have a chicken problem, uh, but we really had no intention to get into these huge businesses. We just started out. He was a commercial fisherman. He's fished his mm-hmm. entire life and he wanted a boat. So we figured things out. He asked his dad for a boat that they had at, at their boat yard and it wasn't running. And he asked his dad for it. And his dad said, no. You can't have it. 
So, you know, my husband just threw up his hands and was like, I'll just keep fishing for my parents. And I told him, no, huh? we're going to figure this out. So because I was a teacher, um, I did have the income and we pulled out several personal loans. We learned that nobody will fund you if you want to buy a boat. And so... Nobody's going to fund you if you want to start a business. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's all of them, yeah. honestly. honestly. Yeah. And, and we had no idea, no training. The education system, you know, didn't prepare us for this. Um, mm -hmm. I'd had a business before that I ran with my dad and sold, but nobody taught me how. I just figured it out as we went along the way. So we... we uh, got a couple personal loans. One of them was at 12% interest, you know, looking back at it. But, you know, my my credit was okay. His was horrible. Mm -hmm. He'd never made a loan. He'd never had a credit card. So, you know, but we did what we had to do. We paid off, I think, got a boat, um, paid off probably a hundred grand in debt within the first year and a half. Wow. Off of you. what he was fishing. So wow. we, and provided a living at the same time. And yeah. provided yeah, a living. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, I think at that time we had three or four kids, four kids and continued to do it. And I told him we had to be debt free because, you know, we were living in teacher housing. So we're living in a 600 square foot, two bedroom, one bath house provided wow. by the state because wow. I was a teacher. With four kids. With four kids. Oh yeah. My. And then soon to be five. So I was, you know, pregnant again and um, was, we need to buy property and never thought you look at the prices, nothing in Hanna's for sale for less than $800,000 now. Sure. This was in, you know, the market was just starting to dip back or, you know, go back up. It was, what was it, 2015? And we found a foreclosure on five acre, five and a half acres of land. Wow. And didn't want to look at it. But, you know, I honestly attri attribute a lot to where we are because of blessings, you know, and even... No, and you've since, so let's talk about this for a second. And you've since picked up a second property. So you've got seven property. and a half acres yeah. now, which seems, you know, going from a 600 square foot housing for teachers yeah. to now owning seven and a half acres that you have really leveraged the leveraged land. It, yeah. You've leveraged the land to only enhance your, your business at this and point. And well, we were focused only on the fishing. And so we figured we'll get a couple chickens, you know, bring up some of the stuff, raise some of the animals that we grew up raising just to feed our family, to be, you know, food mm. sovereign. We live in a very remote area of the island. If the road ever closes down, what are we gonna do? So we started out with like, I think 10 chickens and then slowly, you know, well, we got a lot of eggs. Maybe we should start selling the eggs. Mm. Well, we need more eggs, you know, people are buying our eggs and it just kept growing. You know, I, I honestly can say sometimes like, how did we get here? You know, we just, mm raised our kids with intention, wanted to teach them work ethic. And then I started bringing stu some of my students onto the property to teach them about growing their own food, soil remediation, um, invasive species. Talk about that for a bit, because I think that part's important. So we talk about your students, the type of teacher you are is? Special education There you teacher. go. Yeah. I work at a K-12 school, so I am certified K-12 in special education. Mm. I started out in elementary. I, my degree is in elementary education. But the opportunity came up for me to further my certification and work in um, in special education. So one year they needed me in culinary arts, and I told the kids they were they were a handful for the culinary arts teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so I told them, well, let's go to my house and we'll go start working with the animals. Nice. And we started harvesting rabbits. What, uh, what does that do for the kids? Teaches them where their food comes from. Okay. Um, even though we live in a very rural community, they're still very. Um, Leo is the word. I'm very used to um, going to the store and buying their food. Sure. Sorry, sometimes I'll use Hawaiian words because I don't remember the English word. Um, but they'll go to the store to buy food. They don't know where that hamburger came from. Okay. They don't know where the chili came from. Mm, yeah. What about self-esteem? Is it? It gave them a sense of purpose. Don't because, you think? Yeah, yeah. It gave them a sense of purpose. They were proud of themselves, and not only because we do live in a hunting community and they do some of the larger game, but teaching them to dress out rabbit, meat rabbits. Mm getting them to try duck eggs, you know, when at first it was like, you know, they were all, ew, you know, and harvested a cow with them. We brought them onto the, our property and harvested an entire cow and showed them how to have little to no waste. Everything was used. And, and it really gave the kids kind of blows your mind, yeah. you know, because it's so much more than going to the store and just grabbing a package of hamburger. Anyway. Ignorance is bliss sometimes, I think. Yeah, <laughs> Costco's down the street. Uh, you know, dress, dressing a rabbit yeah. Yeah, might not be my thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. My eight-year-old, or my seven-year-old, she's not quite eight yet, but my seven-year-old can show you. 
But I remember going to Noni's house and we'd go to the store and I bought a whole chicken and I started cutting it all up. And Noni's like, why don't you just buy it in pieces? There you it's go. Because like, if you buy the whole raw chicken, it's only three, four bucks, you know? That blew my mind. I was like, you know, now we do our own, we do our own meat birds. So we've expanded. I think we're on about, I want to say a hundred meat birds so far this year. Jeez. And plucking them, raising them, plucking them, um, dressing them out. We brine them and then we bag them. Um, we do halves and holes for just to feed our community. So we've really grown from just doing it from our kids. So farmer's market. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. COVID yeah. It's a local, pivot. local market right there in, in Hana. It's crazy. It, and it's fun. And I've, I've been several times at this point just to witness the dance that, that sure. goes on. Right. And it's, it's super wild. It's just wild to me. And, and I'm telling you watch like in every time I've been there and I know it's the same week in week out for them, but the amount of people that line up, yeah. just waiting for their stuff. It's, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, and that's been the biggest <laughs> gift I think is, is our first gift was to teach our children and to feed ourselves. And then our second gift was to share it with some of the students and bring them onto the farm and teach them things with the younger kids. It's um, soil remediation and planting seeds and harvesting, sending them home with plants to ha having some of my high schoolers work for us on mm -hmm. the farm where we pay them. And then the third gift was to turn around and give it back to the community. We'll talk about, so, so let's go back for a second because I, I'm interested to hear your take on, on it. Right. So, so Greg, you, you helped Greg get his first boat mm -hmm. and now he's on his own. Right. And I heard you say in a conversation earlier, you know, Greg has generations of fishermen in his family. He's native Hawaiian going back to when they were using canoes mm -hmm. <laughs> to go out and fish. Right. So so fishing clearly is in his blood and it's something that has really blown up. And one thing that I think is is interesting for people to hear is all the way to the point of meeting, you know, very famous chef in Las Vegas. Uh, and supplying those to major restaurants at at the, at the Wynn Hotel and doing that for a number of years, very, very successfully, uh, which is really incredible. I mean, to the point of, of, wow, I mean, that probably put you in a position to buy property, that put you in a position to do a lot of different things to start to, start to expand, not just your farm, but your lifestyle and your businesses and 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 whatnot. So the, the, the fishing part of what you guys do, like that's, that's the start, you know, and then it's just blossomed into something altogether different, which, you know, there's a term for that. It's vertical integration, right? So like you've created multiple businesses to feed an entire. Yeah, but, but starting <laughs> as a lifestyle yeah. first and then turning it into a lifestyle business. Yeah. Through this evolution. Yeah. Well, in our relationship with the hotel in Las Vegas came about from public uh, community service that we were doing for the other fishermen pro pro programs that we were doing through. Um, a government agency in order to help support the local fishermen. Mm. And so, you know, again, those blessings that come into our life from, you know, trying to do the right thing and help others always led us onto these, these better paths. And so, so what does that look like? So you, you catch a fish on an island mm -hmm. and somehow the next night somebody's eating it in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> what does that much. supply chain look like? What's so the process? Greg would come in, um, he'll, they leave for fishing right at dawn. Um, most times it's with our kids. We have a couple other um, younger kids that we brought on to work with us. Okay. Um, they launch at dawn, but they'll go fishing. Um, you got to try several different methods, several different areas. If the fish is happening, my husband always takes that pause, starts calling the market. You don't want to call market before you catch the fish and you don't want to catch the fish without the market. Sure. So he always makes sure and he takes that pause when we were working with, um, Vegas, it was, you know, they wanted pictures, you know, so that the, sh the executive chef can go around and show people the fish they're eating and the fishermen. And um, so then once their catch is in, they're in by 5 p.m., um, come home, wash down, unload the boat, load up the truck, and then Greg drives two hours to the other side and delivers the fish to Kahului in order to be packed airport, up. Airport, right, right at the airport. Yeah, packed so up and shipped. Packed and shipped all in the same evening. Yes. We had a joke, they flew us up to Vegas for some PR. And the fish flew one airline and we flew another airline. The fish beat us to Vegas. <laughs> wow. The fish was in Vegas before we were there. And it was amazing. So we go into the kitchen in Vegas for this PR event and Greg, my husband's smelling the fish. You know, yeah. he, he's very conscientious about how his, about our product, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we all are, but he was, he's in there smelling this mahi mahi, making sure that it was still eyes are clear. 
they take really good care of it, you know, and, and we worked with a fish packing company that we knew and trusted. They'd been on the island for over 25 years. So from you goes to a packer, goes to a shipper, goes to a distributor. No, it goes from straight to the hotel, to the straight to the hotel, yeah. straight to the hotel. Yeah. The hotel right. picks it up from the airline. Wow. So it's, it's from Maui. It's there within seven hours. So the relationship is direct between you and yeah. the hotel. Yeah. 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 Personally, okay. we're talking to the executive chef. Um, at the fish packing, we're talking to the person in charge, and we still have great relationships with those people. You know, it's interesting to me, you know, fast forward to today, right? And and when I hear all of that, and obviously knowing you guys as well as I do, it's it's interesting to me to hear you say, you know, like in talking to Greg today, and then, you know, talking to you earlier about today, he's fishing maybe one day a week, mostly supplying mama's fish house on on the island uh, really on an what i heard you say on an as needed basis mm -hmm. because of the relationship that you've established and so what i like about that is that i feel like okay well now fishing is just a part of what you guys do and you do it when you need to do it and it's not it's not the driver necessarily anymore and it's and you're not dependent on it no, it's, it's that it's the same thing that we do with our farming is, is we really know that you can't farm one thing and base your entire business off of it. Mon monoculture is out of the picture. You know, you have to have mm. diversified agriculture. And so that's kind of been our monotony, our thinking with our business is diversified business. So from the fishing, it was like, why are we spending eight to, eight to $13,000 a year on ice? I go, let's go. Once we bought our own house, let's go get our own ice machines. So then we're not spending the money. We're not having to, it's hard to get ice in Hana. That rolled into a whole nother business of where now the fishermen are coming to us to buy ice and we're supplying the largest um, mom and pop grocery store with 50 pound bags of ice. I mean, let me, l l let me paint this picture for you because it was surreal in July. You know, Shelby and I were out there in July and I'm eating organic every day because I'm 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 waking up and they had um, just recently had killed a wild boar and so they had made this sausage this pork wild boar pork sausage okay. and and then her daughter is waking up with us she was staying with us and then she would just walk out to the chicken coop grab a couple eggs crack the eggs with me or we're, we're we're making eggs and then frying up this sausage mm -hmm. right this this fresh wild boar sausage on top of it i'm cutting up fresh lilikoi from their property and fresh bananas from their property and that's the bre breakfast i'm starting the day with as organic as it gets super super crazy then that night he's coming back with his fresh catch we're eating sashimi, <laughs> a little bit of sushi, you know, just, I mean, it was, it was totally surreal. It was amazing. And, and the food's amazing. Her husband's a great chef as well. Um, he, he's been cooking for us while he's been here. Uh, I just, I marvel at what they've done. I mean, she's made this papaya slaw that is incredible. <laughs> and it's, it's that, remember in our last episode, we talked about the old adage, you know, the fishermen down in the, the village and he said, Hey, I caught this fish. It's, you can package it, sell it all over the world. And, you know, and then what, right? right? right. I, I almost caught myself going, man, we got to package this slaw yeah. and we got to get it in Costco because we can make a boatload of money. And, and then I so looked then at, you go sit I, on an island right, somewhere. And, 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 oh, wait, so I could go live in, anyway. so yeah, I could go okay. retire in Hana <laughs> on yeah. seven and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it was with like a lot of our products is, you know, things started picking up. We started at the farmer's market with just some of our extra fruit and not even our fish, just some like we made some deer jerky and then it just kept growing and expanding. And like we make things for our own family, like the Italian sausage, yeah. um, our standard yeah. sausage, our smoked pork, like all these little things that we were making anyway. Like, well, let's go see if they'll sell at the market. And it just kept leveling up and leveling up the, the papaya slaw. You know, that was just because I liked it. Yeah. And then it's like, well, I have some extra. Let's package it up. And now I'm beholden to making it every week. Because <laughs> everybody wants it. Market. It's yeah. incredible. So it, we had an online order today and I was calling my brother. Like, I don't even want, I can't even eat a fish taco at this point because I'm telling you, you will not eat a better fish taco than the fresh fish from them and her papaya slaw hmm. on that taco. You know, you put a little sriracha on it and that's all it needs. And it's an incredible fish taco. But, you know, that's that you got something very special. Uh, and I love that about what you've got going on. You've got it special and and you've you you've humbly 
recognize, I mean, I, I want to call you out and recognize you for your self-awareness and the, and your EQ uh, at, at the fact that you've recognized that you've created the lifestyle that you want. And it doesn't have to be this big blown up thing. No. But, but it's interesting because that lifestyle was created out of necessity. Yeah. It was the lifestyle where most of us are building a business to get to a lifestyle. Yeah. It's just, it's, congratulations. Well, good for you. You know, I, I always think it's a dream, like even getting the house, you know, and that was, that was how many, seven years ago. And I always think the bank's going to call us up and be like, we're sorry, you weren't supposed to get that. You know, <laughs> like the second property, we, we bought an additional two acres and I, you know, again, it's those blessings. And I'm like, how are we pulling this off? Let's get and you that property in between too. In Let's between, just get yeah. That all. Yeah. So uh, there's a property in between us that, you know, it's, nobody's doing anything with it. It's sitting empty, but you know, because we have the five kids, our, our whole goal was to have enough property so that the kids would have a foundation, you know, and, and those 10 chickens that we started out with are now probably over 200 chickens. Jeez. You know, we've got 60 meat birds at home. They're about um, six weeks old, we'll be harvesting those in another six weeks. Sheep, meat rabbits, we just did a big harvest there. Um, pigs, we're raising our own pigs. We still do some of the wild caught. We, uh, you know, in San Clemente, I got to be careful with her husband because you know how many rabbits there are cruising around San Clemente. Yeah. Well, so he finally spotted them yeah. all. Don't get any ideas here, buddy. He's, he keeps going down. He's, he's been out of the water too long. We're, we're at about nine days now. He's been to Dana Point like seven or eight times walking around the boats and I took, that him, I took him down to the harbor this morning. Getting a little itchy, is he? Yeah, yeah. He's definitely, he's on edge. This is like his max. He's got to kill something soon. He tried fishing in Big Bear, you know, and it's it's amazing how you can be so talented in one place and then you go into a new area and it's like, we don't know what we're doing, you know? <laughs> But it's it's always humbling and good, you know. It's you know oh, we we won't tell them about. There's not enough time. But the raccoon story. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll skip. We'll, we'll, we'll so skip what's that what's, one. what's next then? I mean, are are you going to continue to to look for evolution within this always. brands of business? The kids, a place for them to live, work, and start their careers I, too. Or I would. How like does that to, look? I would like to teach them more about the business aspect right now. They see it as the work aspect, but Greg and I have discussed, you know, and they are younger, but having them branch out into their own businesses because they do like to make money, you know, and, and we let them, if you collect the eggs, you so they can make it. enough to go live on an island. Somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. No, they want to come. They want, they to, want to come. come they want to come stay with Uncle yeah, Vinny and Amy Shelby. Uncle Vinny, they want to go to Big Bear. They like skiing, you know, it's, it's they, they've skied for the first time. So they like snow, but um, it's, you know, I, I really, I always want to be humble. I just want to keep our existence living. I want to be able to pay the bills. You know, ultimately right now, my biggest goal is, is to set something up more formal so that we're bringing more kids to our farm because I, my, I like that a lot. My kids do it all the time. They know how to do it, mm -hmm. but there are so many other kids that, you know, especially working in special education, you know, you, you aren't the most successful person in the classroom. Sometimes that's certainly how it was for me. Yeah. But then to go out into the aina, into the land, and you are successful. Yeah. You know, you can plant that seed and grow that plant, yeah. you know, and teaching them to be a little more self-sufficient. You don't have to do everything. We're not going to be full homesteaders. You know, I still need to buy my bread. I try to buy it at the farmer's market from other people. But, you know, that trading, you know, we, we do bees, you know, and teaching the kids about bees and harvesting honey and what to do with the wax and soil remediation. You know, all this fish we're cutting up all the animals we harvest, you know, you do have some scrap that's not usable sure. for food part. And then, so let's build our soil back up with that. Yeah. How do we create better soil so that we don't have to use pesticides and fertilizers and, you know, working with worms and things like that. So, and some plant-based, you know, just more learning and fun. I, I really like it. You know, one day I'd, I'd like to not have to go to my Monday, Friday job. You know, right now it is a great way for me to go and be with kids and bring them yeah. to the farm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to eventually, you know, spend more time on the farm and still bring kids to the farm. Sure. Um, but, you know, I'm also setting up a nonprofit, Hana Cattlemen's Association, just to help out with um, it's difficult for the cattlemen and Hana to get resources. And being on an island, it's not easy for, you know, you've got 200 head of cattle. What are you going to do with it? You know, it's hard for the smaller Cattlemen and Hana to compete with some of the bigger ranches. Sure. So I asked, you know, why aren't you guys joining together? Why, you know, it's the same thing we do when there's a roundup or yeah. branding. We all come together and help each other out. Why isn't anybody doing that on the business side? 
So that's the, our next great adventure. Well, people are doing that. They're just not yeah. doing it in, Maha- in Hana. No, you know, that, that's exactly what happens. And and so it's good. It just takes leadership, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I, I think having spent enough time in Hana, yeah, I mean, you're in a small place. There isn't always somebody that's that's ready to step up into a leadership role. Thankfully, they have you. Well, to do the paperwork, that's yeah. what it mostly is. And, you know, ha ha. It's a lot of work. I mean, I you know, when you're school, volunteering at anything. Well, it's, it's more than, it's, I'm sorry, it's more than paperwork. Then it's called Logistics. it leader, leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Getting people, so having having somebody that people will congregate around for these ideas. Yeah. Because they might see each other as competitors, these cattlemen, these small cattlemen. They're looking for the same market. But what you're doing is bringing them together so that they can see greater opportunity for themselves. Well, and it came about because of the farmer's market was yeah. we didn't have time to go harvest beef. So I contacted some of the other cattlemen, like, do you, do you want us to sell your hamburger? Do you want us to sell your teriyaki? And, you know, not taking any cut at all. I don't, we take nothing from it, but it's just to provide the people with the groceries that they want with the food yeah. products and saving us time because both Greg's parents and my parents have cattle. I don't have the time to go deal with the whole cow. There's not nine days in the week yet. So help out another cattleman and it's worked out it's benefited everybody it benefits the community it benefits us and it benefits the people just trying to run their small farms i want to go back to something that you said earlier that that uh stood out for me and you talked about you know uh, working off the land having the land Uh, obviously it's a legacy for for your kids but your kids have been off and on involved in the business uh, and a lot of that has to do with what you said uh, to teach work ethic. Uh, so, so, so obviously, I've 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 watched you. I know you, and I'm so proud of you. And one thing that you have is just incredible work ethic. And Greg has it too. And I wa- I watch you guys, and I'm I, I'm just blown away. I mean, just at the 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 pure physical effort and work ethic that it takes to run a business like what you're talking about. You know, you can't succeed in any bootstrap business if you don't have <laughs> yeah. that work ethic. Yeah. Like bootstrap by itself is difficult. Just starting with nothing, getting a loan from a bank or a credit card or whatever it might be is, is how bootstrappers get it. And if they want to cruise, it's not going to happen. Now. Well, but how many people do you know? I mean, entrepreneurs, do you know that, that, that lack work ethic? I mean, how many young people right now have you seen or witnessed that that is like, I think, I mean, I don't have anybody in my organization that's lacking work ethic. I mean, we, I'm we, glad you said that. we, we, <laughs> that's good. No, no, I want to clear that up because yeah. I get the, the one thing, the team that we have in place right now, like I, I, man, I'm, I continue to just be blown away at the level of work ethic, but I think that's because uh, you know, my business partner and I, we, we lead by example, right? Yeah. So, so there's, there's no, there's no shortage of work ethic in our organization. I've seen other organizations where there's a big lack of work ethic. Well, we've all got to get our hands dirty, you know, and there's no point in having anybody working for you where you're just directing them, but then I'm in an air conditioned office. So I think a lot of it has to do with the work ethic. I know working with my kids, they'll respond better if I'm out there with them working rather than even if I'm trying to do the laundry or I'm in the house. It's not the same as being out there and working with them. We've all all hands on deck. You know, everybody's out there doing something at all times mm-hmm. and contributing. And for them to see like this trip is kind of an end result of all of their hard work. They they got to go and do take a vacation and do That's something great. fun. Yeah. You need that reward. Um but it's also that teaching the kids about when a job is well done, selling that product, when somebody comes back and tells you how much they like something or how much they appreciate it, that's, that's, the, that's the driving force. You know, it's not the bottom dollar. It's, and, you know, honestly, we, we do underprice our items just because we want to continue to feed our community and the people in our community whom we care very much about. But it's that feedback. It's that appreciation. It's the you know, being here, the phone calls we're getting, the text messages, you know, and and even though people are bummed, they're still saying, you know, you guys deserve it. You guys are doing a great job. We appreciate you. You know, it's the the, the feedback from the customers. Yeah, that's great. Well, we're getting towards the end here. So this has been uh, interesting to see a completely different type of business than we've had before, right? So work in the dirt, work in the ocean, all with your hands. Yeah. And 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 the bosses are out getting dirty with, the staff, yeah. whether those are kids or yeah. students, students or, or others. Other right? people, yeah. yeah. We have, we have so th- it's terrific to hear to hear this story. So um, 
uh, I talk to us a little bit about your, your nonprofit and if anyone wants to give you any help and guidance, how they can get in touch with you on that. Because starting a nonprofit is not an easy task. No. And we have a lot of people in the audience who have done that and maybe they might want to give you some some advice. That would be great because, you know, we've, we've done a lot of the paperwork. We've got the state requirements taken care of. We're just doing the next steps. And um, we started an Instagram for our farm this year. Um, first time we've been on social media and it's at GG Lind Farm. That's on Instagram. That's all. That's as far as I've gotten. I don't know how to do the TikTok yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, reach out to us at GG Lind Farm because we we are looking for help in order to start doing the federal paperwork in order to get Great. it recognized as a nonprofit. Mm. But again, it's just helping the local cattle ranchers. These are all family run farms. These are people who've done it for generations, like my my parents yeah. and my husband Greg's parents. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're looking at our only basic processing facility on the island is is said to be shutting down. Mm -hmm. And so we're really looking into what the options are being on an island being, you know, 3,000 miles away from the nearest processing facility doesn't work for us. But there are some mobile units and some other options that we've been looking into. Great. But I just want to help the other cattlemen. You know, Great. I want to help my in-laws, my stepdad, my Uncle Frank, Cabral guys. Um, there's some other younger guys that are starting up some some of their own. You know, they've got like 10, 12. So for any of the listeners out there that have that have gone through the 501c3 process, why don't you get in touch with uh, with uh, Gina and, and provide some thoughts and some ideas, right? Yeah. We like sharing with the community as well. And uh, although I can't share any food, we can share business contacts. Yeah. And, and I always like, you know, that was always important. What I've learned in doing this is asking for help. Yeah. You know, because if you're, you can't be too proud to beg. <laughs> well, I think there's some killer lessons from this, Scott. I mean, when, when, when I hear the story and know, and I'm close to it, uh, I hear that there's, there is a need. I mean, I don't care if you're talking about what Gina and her husband does or whether you're talking about, you know, uh, coaching businesses or you're talking about manufacturing business, whatever it is. There is a need for ownership often to be hands on. Yeah. And and I think there's there's no trade off for being hands on. The second thing is around work ethic. You know, we brought that up and I think there, there is no substitute for work ethic. There just isn't. Uh, and, and I think you, you, you see it. And when you see it in, in, in leadership, you tend to mimic it. So my takeaway is a little bit different. It, it, it wasn't from the business side, but it, it applies to the business. And that is getting these kids involved. And not, mm. your, not your own children, which is great. Yeah. That's what parents are supposed to do. But the special special ed kids that, that you're teaching, bring them to the farm. We can do that too, guys. We can do that too. We can get people out there, uh, the people that are struggling, people that are in need, people that you can give, give uh, uh, not giving a hand out, it's giving a hand up, right? Yeah. So that's the part that really resonated with me. So I, I appreciate that. that you did that. Yeah. Love that. All right. That's it. Well, we, we, we did all, we did what we needed to at the beginning of the show, right? Yeah. So if you've made it this far, thank you for listening. Appreciate we it. appreciate you as always. Yeah. Don't forget to su subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on all the regular channels and uh, we appreciate you till next, next time. time. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for joining us for the CEO podcast. Please visit us at the CEO podcast.net where you can learn more about our co-hosts and listen to past episodes. If you would like to have a discussion and dive deeper into any topic, there is also an option to contact Scott or Vince to schedule some time with them. Thanks for listening.